Hello everyone, welcome to Algebra 2A Live. We're going through week 11, nearing the end of the term. We're going to be looking at radical functions today. So week of 11 assignments, make sure you go into the textbook, watch this video, take some notes. Let me know if you have any questions as you work through the paper, pencil problems, and all the other assignments for this week. Here's what we're going to be working on, the week 11 objectives. I want you to be able to rewrite expressions with exponents into expressions with radicals, and then vice versa. We're going to learn how to simplify and rewrite expressions by applying all those wonderful laws of exponents to expressions with radicals and rational exponents. We're going to then go switch and look at some graphs. We're going to apply translations and reflections to graphs of square root functions and cube root functions. We're going to analyze the characteristics of square root and cube root functions, such as end behavior, domain, range, inflection points. And then finally, if I give you points on a graph, can you determine if it is a square root or a cube root function and then write in an equation to model the graph? So lots going on working with square roots, radicals, and exponents this week. So we are finally done with polynomials. We're switching gears and we're going to be looking at a new class of functions called radical functions. They're all in this form. So there's, there's my f of x, my new function, and it's equal to the nth root. This could be square root, cube root, fourth root, but it's the nth root of x minus h plus k, where h and k move it right or left, k moves it up or down. We're going to look at examples of functions and practice working with expressions that involve square roots. To help get ready with this new class of function, we're first going to see how radicals and fraction exponents are related. Then we're going to review properties of exponents and rewrite expressions. And then we're really going to dig into graphs, functions, and tables and see how they are all related. Okay, here we go. Let's do some review. How would I solve the following equation? Some number squared equals 36. Well, this is a quadratic equation, and we learned that if you want to solve it, if I want to get x by itself, to undo squaring, we take the square root of both sides, and we would see that x equals both positive or negative 6. That's pretty easy, right? But that was the whole idea, is that square root and squaring are opposite things. And so... In our class so far, as we've worked with exponents and radicals and quadratics and stuff, we've learned then that taking the square root of a number squared just leaves x, so it just leaves you the number. Square root and squaring cancel out. But then we also have the power of a power property, right? If we have x to the one-half to the squared power, well, the power of a power property says we multiply those together. And since one-half times 2 equals 1, we just end up with x to the first power. Well, if that's true, if both of those expressions end up just turning into x, then both of these things must equal each other. Taking the square root of a number squared is the same thing as taking x squared and then taking it to the 1 half power they both are the same. And that leads us then into the rational root theorem. For any radical of an nth root, we can rewrite it as a fraction exponent. So there you go, the nth root of x is equal to x to the one over nth power. So here's some examples of how that works. So what if we have Oops, hold on, I gotta switch in the pen mode. What if I have eight to the one third power? Well, if I think about that, that's the same as the cube root of eight, but eight itself is two times two times two. So I could rewrite that as the cube root of two to the third power. And guess what happens to cube roots and exponent of three? It just equals two. Okay, what if I have 27 to the 7 thirds power? How can I work with that? 
Well, I can rewrite the third as the cube root. Again, remember, anything in the denominator can turn into the root. And so that leaves 27 to the seventh. So the seven stays with the 27, but I just changed the bottom number of the exponent into the radical. And I could rewrite it as, well, the cube root of 27 all to the seventh. It doesn't matter which one you do first, the radical or the exponent. The cube root of 27, we know that's just 27 is 3 times 3 times 3, so the cube root of 27 just becomes 3. And 3 to the 7th is much easier. That's 3 times 3 times 3. I'm going to pull up my calculator. And 3 to the 7th power is 2,187. So that's a little bit of how we can use and rewrite fractional exponents into root form, root form into fractional exponents, etc. I also want to show you how to do it with your calculator. How can we calculate things that are taken to fractional exponents or roots? So we're going to switch into Desmos calculator mode and do some examples in there as well. All right, here we are at the Desmos calculator. I've got the keyboard pulled up. There is my radical. So if I want to calculate the square root of anything, I can use that button. So the square root of 50 is about 7.07. .07. But what if I want to do other roots? What if I want to calculate the third root or the fourth root? So I'm going to go to my functions, and go to miscellaneous, and there is my nth root button. So if I click on that, notice it's got a spot to put the third root. So I can put third root right there. And what do I want to calculate the third root of? Let's do 68. So the cube root or the third root of 68 is about 4.08. It's an irrational number. We can do any, any root here. So let me do the fifth root of 32. Well, that's a nice even one, right? Because the fifth root of 32 is 2 because 2 to the fifth power is 32. So there we go, so I have a ways to calculate any nth roots. And we can also do the same thing with uh, fractional exponents. So we have the square root of 50, that's the same as 50. And I'm gonna come in here and click a to the b. Let's do the 1 half power. 50 to the 1 half power is the same as the square root of 50. 68. Click this little a b button to get exponents to the one third power is 4.08 it's the same as the cube root of 68 and finally we can do 32 to the one fifth and we also get two that way so we have ways of working with radicals things in radical form or rewriting them as exponent form that's a little bit of an introduction to rational exponents and radicals. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint and look at some other stuff here. <clears throat> so fortunately, even though we're working now with radicals and fractional exponents and more complicated uh, algebraic expressions, all of our same exponent properties still apply. We have the product property, which says if you're multiplying the same base, we can add the exponents. With the quotient property for dividing by the same base, we can subtract the exponents. And the power of a power property says if you have a number to a power into another power, we can multiply them. Well, notice this works for m and n. They can be any number. They can be positive, negative. They can be whole numbers. They can also be fractions or decimals. So now that we know how to work with fractional exponents and radicals, we can actually use these same properties. So let's go, let's simplify the following expression. We have four times d to the three-fifths power times eight to the one-third power times d to the two-fifths power. And let's simplify this thing out. So first of all, we can rearrange it. I can rewrite this as four times eight to the one-third times d to the three-fifths times d to the two-fifths. So rewriting it in expanded form sometimes helps us see things a little bit better. Okay, now let's start with our numbers. Four and eight 
I'm, since we're working with so many exponents, I can recognize that 4 is simply 2 squared, and 8 is simply 2 to the third. So let's rewrite those like that. And now we kind of see some interesting things going on, right? 2 to the third to the 1 third, well, the cube here and the 1 third cancel each out, leading just 2. And then 2 to the square times another 2 makes 2 to the third. We've now just simplified all of that real numbers. Now let's take a look at all of the stuff with the D. Let's simplify that. So d to the 3 fifths times d to the 2 fifths. Well, if you remember with fraction exponents, if we're multiplying by the same base, we can add the exponents. So this turns into d to the 3 fifths plus 2 fifths. Fortunately, I have the same denominator, and I'm really good at adding fractions. So 3 fifths plus 2 fifths equals d to the 5 fifths. And that just simplifies down to d to the first power, or d1, or just d itself. So when it's all said and done, 2 to the third equals 8 times d. It all simplifies into that. Look at that. Great job simplifying that expression. Let's do another one. Okay, now I've got a whole bunch of stuff all to the 4 thirds power. I'm going to use the power of a power property, right? So everything inside gets the 4 third power and we deal with it by multiplying the exponents, right? Any number to the power to another power, you multiply m times n. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take three to the three halves times four thirds times x to the four times four thirds times y to the six fifths times four thirds. And now I gotta be good at multiplying my fractions. So hopefully you remember all your fraction stuff. Three halves times four thirds, you multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators. That turns into three to the 12 six. X here, now I've got four times four is 16. That's four over one, so that's just 16 thirds times Y. 6 times 4 is 24, and 5 times 3 is 15. Okay, now what do I do with this? Some stuff simplifies nicely. 3 to the 12 6 is the same as 3 to the 2, because 12 divided by 6 is 2. But now i got some weird stuff with x's. So how do I simplify this? Well, x to the 16 thirds, I can rewrite that as 5 and one third, right? Three goes into 16 five times with the remainder of one third, so it's five plus one third. And then finally, the y, 15 goes into 24 one time with the remainder of nine, so one and nine fifteenths. And the nine fifteenths, I can reduce that down dividing by three, it turns into three fifths. I'm gonna go ahead and do that here. 3, 1, and 3 fifths. Now here's a funny thing or an interesting thing. When we have 5 and 1 third, that's the same as 5 plus 1 third, right? And with exponent properties, that means if when we, whenever we would add the exponents, it means we're multiplying the base. So I can rewrite everything this way now. So 3 squared is 9, that's done, that's settled, we like that. x to the 5th, x to the 5 and 1 thirds, I can rewrite as x to the 5th times x to the 1 third. I can rewrite it separately. I can put them back together and add the exponents, but let's keep them apart. Let's keep the whole number part and the fraction exponent separate. And then I can change y into y to the 1st times y to the 3 fifths. And now we can put all of this back together and simplify things out. We've got 9 times x to the fifth times y. Those all have whole number exponents. We took care of all those. 
But now I have x to the one third, I can rewrite that as the cube root of x. So cube root of x times y to the three fifths. Well, that's the fifth root of y to the third. There we go. It doesn't look super simple, but you know, we did, we simplified it out a little bit. But there you go, there's a couple examples of working with exponents, fractions in the exponents, and all of our exponent properties. We now can start looking at graphs. Let's start tackling some of these square root and cube root functions. We're gonna start working with square root functions first. And all square root functions can be written in this form. We're gonna talk about what all these things mean what a does, what h does, what k does, this whole square root. And uh, we're going to start by just playing around with it on our Decimos calculator, looking for some connections between what we see in the graph and the equation. So let's go back to our Decimos calculator. here. All right, here we are. I've got some sliders in. And I'm going to start with leaving a as 1. I'm going to put h as 0 and k as 0. And let's look at the very basic function. So right now we've got y equals square root of x because we made h0, k0, and a is just 1. So what do we see? This is an interesting function right here. It looks like it starts right here at 0, 0. So it doesn't go left and it doesn't go down. And then it continues on from there to the right and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as I keep going to the right. But there's definitely a starting place. Uh, come on, get rid of that. So watch what happens now when I move h over. Let's make h 1. So now we have x minus 1. And what did that do? It moved it over one unit to the right. Let's make h 2. That moved it over two units to the right. We have x minus 2. If I make x, if I make h a negative number, let's do negative three. Now it moves it to the left three units. So h moves it to the right or left. It does our horizontal translations. So we can really easily tell from the equation whatever we're adding or subtracting to x, we're moving it to the right or left, and it's telling us the x value that our function starts at. Okay, let's play at k now. Let's leave it h at zero. K, it's our y-intercept, right? If I make K at 2, where does it start at? It starts up 2 units. Instead of 0, 0, now it starts at 0, 2. If I make K negative 5, now it's going down negative 5. If I move H and K, there's moving 2 units to the right and 5 units down. So H and K together tell you where your square root function starts. It's the first starting point. All right, let's talk about a. Let's make h0 again. Let's make k0 again. Now, for the value of a, I want to add, I'll turn this off, I want to add the point 1, 1. So notice my function goes right through that point, right there. So 1, 1, if I take just f of x equals the square root of x, and there's no translations, and a is 1, then it goes over 1, up 1. It's kind of, this, it's kind of a hallmark. All equations will do that for square root functions over 1 and up 1, unless we change the value for a. What happens when I make a 2? Well, now it's not going through the 1, 1 point. Now it seems like it's going over 1, up 2, right there, right? What happens if I make a 3? Now it's growing faster. Now it's going to go over 1, up 3 units. So this value for a is taking whatever value we get from the square root of that number, and again, if the square root of 1 is 1, so the value of a is just making it 1 times whatever a is. 
So in this case, it's 3 times 1. So A stretches our function taller. It's sort of a little bit like the slope, but it's making it grow faster. You can also make A a fraction. What happens when I make it 1 half? So now instead of over 1 up 1, that's going over 1 up a half. Look at that. So there's my value for A. Now watch what happens when I make A negative. So negative A's make it go down. Now it's opening downward. A negative value in front gives it a reflection. It flips it over the x-axis. So we call a reflection. I can also make a reflection over the y-axis by making x negative. So anytime we add negatives into places, then it makes the graph open left instead of right, or open down instead of up. So there's a good introduction to radical functions. And the one thing I really want to zero in on is the reason why it starts right here, or why there is a clear starting spot, is because for a square root, we've learned this with quadratics, I can't take the square root of a negative number. So all this stuff, this x minus h underneath the square root, it has to be 0 or greater than 0. And that helps you find the domain. All right, so let's go back and summarize some of the points we found by playing with, the, playing with this calculator. In summary, we have this equation. The starting point for every square root function is at this point h or k. We can tell that right from the equation. The value for a stretches or shrinks it vertically, makes it grow taller or shrinks it down. If there is a negative number or if there's a negative in front of the a, it reflects over the x-axis and makes it open down. If there is a negative in front of the x, it reflects over the y-axis and makes my function go left. The domain for a square root function is all the numbers that make the square root greater than or equal to 0. So if I wanted to solve it, if I wanted to find the domain, I'm going to look at what's inside here for any function. The domain is when x minus h is greater than or equal to 0. Or if I add h to both sides, all the x values greater than or equal to h. That's the domain. The range is related to my value for k. So if I move it up k units, the range is all the numbers above it. If it opens down because of a negative sign, then my range would be all the numbers below it. But anyways, the range is, has the boundary it's very dependent on whatever our value for k is in terms of what y values do we get for this function. All right, there's a little bit of square root functions. Let's now dig into cube root functions. Now we have the third root, or x to the 1 third power. All cube root functions are in this form. The only difference is that instead of a square root with a 2, we have a cube root with a 3. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to graph this in our Desmos calculator, look for some connections between all these values for a, h, and k, and just get a sense of what this graph is doing. Okay, here we are. We now have our cube root function right there with our sliders for a, h, and k, and we're going to see what's going on. Now you notice it's similar in that it also goes to the point 0, 0. So until I start doing some translations, h does the same thing. If I add, if h is a positive number, so x minus 3, guess what? Moves it over 3 to the right. If I make x plus 4, or x plus 5, so x minus negative 5 turns to x plus 5, guess what? Moves it 5 to the left, right there. Same thing with k. k will move it up and down, give me that vertical shifts. So there's moving it up, there's moving it down, depending on whatever I make value for k. And then finally, the same thing with A. A makes it taller or smaller. So notice I have the point 1, 1. But if I make A 2, again, it's going to grow up 
to be over one up two. It's gonna grow twice as fast. Right there, over one up two. So A still stretches or shrinks it. So it's really similar to square root functions. The only difference you notice is that instead of coming down and then stopping right here, my graph keeps going. So the domain is all real numbers and the range is all real. There's no, there's no limitations in my domain and range because with the cube root, I can take the cube root of negative numbers. The square root, I can only square root things that are zero or greater, but with cube root, I can take the cube root of all real numbers. So there's no limitation to the domain or range. So instead of my values for h and k being the starting point, they're now what we call the inflection point. They kind of tell me, okay, from this point, going up it curves to the right, but going down it curves to the left. So zero, zero, my value for h and k, are my inflection point. If I make k2 and, sorry, k3 and h2, now my inflection point is up here, over two for h, and then uh, up three for k. So they matches right there. So that's again telling me where my curve kind of changes. Let's play around with some negatives. What happens when we make some things negative here? So if I put a negative for the a, watch what happens. It kind of spins it around and it flips it the other way. So instead of going up to the right and down to the left, now it goes up to the left and down to the right. It's the opposite. So it's still a reflection. It's like it's mirroring or flipping around the y-axis when I do that. Or actually flipping around the x-axis, sorry. But if I make my value for x negative, now it flips it around that way as well too. So negatives still make things open up in different directions. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. So in summary with cube root functions, sorry, let's just say cube root. Let me go ahead and change that. Cube root functions, that means they have the third root right there. The inflection point is at h and k. The value of a still stretches or shrinks it vertically. If there's a negative in front of the a, it reflects over x. If there's a negative in front of the x, it reflects over the y-axis. The domain is all real numbers, since we can have cube roots of negative values, and the range is all real numbers as well. Okay, the last thing I wanna go over is how to write a function if all we have is a couple points on a graph. We can work backwards, we can take the information we see, and we can write a function that models it. So here we go, we have a graph, it's got a point negative five, negative four, and a point negative one, negative three, and I'm gonna write a function that models this. Well, looking at this, I know right away this is a square root function because it starts at a specific point, whereas I know a cube root function goes all the way to the left and it doesn't stop. So if I'm gonna write a function here, I know this is a square root function. And that's what I'm gonna start off with. So it's a square root function, so I'm gonna have f of x equals a times x minus h, whoops, the square root of x minus h plus k. Now, since I know it's a square root and it's starting at a certain value, I can see it's starting right here. So my value for h has to be negative five, my value for k has to be negative four and it's going up to the right, so I know my value for a is a positive number. So now we've got f of x equals a times the square root of x minus negative five minus four. The only thing I gotta figure out now is this value for a. To do that, we're gonna use one of our other points. We're gonna use the fact that when x is negative one, y is negative three. That's a function value. So we're gonna put those into my function and solve for a. So now we've got negative three, that's my function value. I'm gonna solve for a, 
But if the square root of x is negative 1, so I'm going to put negative in 1 for x, minus negative 5 just turns into plus 5, and then I still have a minus 4. Let's calculate this out. Negative 1 plus 5 is 4. Minus 4 times a equals negative 3. The square root of 4 just turns into 2, so that's 2a minus 4 equals negative 3. I'm going to add 4 to both sides. So, whoops, plus 4. So now I've got 1 equals 2 times a. And if I divide both sides by 2, I see a has to be 1 half. Okay, so we've got our function. This function is f of x equals 1 half, that's what we solved for a, times the square root of x plus 5, based on my 5 right there, negative 5, plus negative 4. That's my value for k right there. I can now take this function I can go to my Desmos calculator and just verify that, yep, it does go through those two points and it looks the same. But we have just worked our way backwards writing a radical function based on what we were given. Okay, there we go. We are done with week 11. That's what you're going to be working on this week. Working with exponents, exponent properties, radicals, re rewriting from radical form to exponent form, using all the laws of exponents, so getting really comfortable with exponent properties, and then doing a lot with graphs, looking at how does my graph move right or left? What does the square root function do? What does the cube root function do? Can I write functions? Can I give you a function and then graph it. So a lot of graphing, a lot of using your Desmos calculator. Again, let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to working with you this week.